experimenter, if you, if you look at my history of Node projects, I create a lot of things and don't always stick with them because I, lo I love experimenting more than I love maintaining. That's, that's just me. But it's fun because the stuff that's valuable people pick up and, and continue with. This is a recent project I started last fall. I was working on, I was working on WebOS, little Palm tablets, and we have Node on those. And Node is kind of heavy for a mobile device. It uses a lot of RAM and a lot of CPU to start up the process. And I wished that Node had been written with a lighter weight VM. But I looked around and for JavaScript, V8 is pretty much the best there is. And so I said, well, I heard about this Lua language. I've never seen it, never touched it, but I hear the VM is very lightweight. So I'm going to rewrite Node in Lua. How hard can that be? All right, so let's see what the plan is. So when Node 6 came out, there was this new library called libuv, which is the underlying primitives of Node. It gives you file system access, network access, child process, all of the basic APIs in Node are provided by this C library. And it's cross-platform, it's great. So basically, libuv is Node in C. So all I gotta do is make Lua bindings to that, and I'm done, right? Well, not really, but we tried. This is how ideas start. You always think it's easier than it really is. So I dug a little deeper, and it turns out Node actually has a lot of C libraries. There's an HTTP parser. We use OpenSSL, which still isn't bound correctly to Node. Zlib for compression, and I think there's a few other tiny ones like C Aries for DNS. And then, of course, there's V8, which provides you with a JavaScript runtime. So here's my plan. This is, this is boating and lake JavaScript. Now, navigating the strait of Lua, the exact same list of C libraries, but instead of V8, I'm going to use LuaJIT, which is a very fast jitted VM for Lua. Very similar to V8. So if we look back and forth, not much has changed, just the language. This should be a very easy transition. So many people ask me, why do you even bother? JavaScript is awesome. Who here likes JavaScript? Everyone likes JavaScript, right? I like JavaScript. I think it's awesome. So LuaJIT's lighter. On these mobile phones I was working on, a node process would start out with 11 megabytes of RAM and 1,000 milliseconds of startup time, which is a lot. Whereas with Lua, it's a fraction of that. It's about a half a meg of RAM and almost instant startup time. And also, writing V8 bindings are C++ and Lua bindings are C. I don't like C++. I prefer C. And of course, there's coroutines, so that's a fun experiment. And there's a really fast FFI, so you can call things like OpenGL without ever writing bindings. And I'm kind of bored with just websites. I want to make other things. So why use JavaScript if I'm not going to use the web? Why not use another language? So there's some motivation here, enough to get me started. So I begin the journey. So I clone libuv. I read the documentation, which consists of the header file. I think now there's like a small book about it, but this was a year ago. The only documentation was a header file. And I joined libuv on, on the IRC channel and asked lots of questions. And by coincidence, I started a new job at Cloud9 where Ben and Bert, the two LibUV maintainers, work. So now they're my coworkers. I can ask them questions. So this was very nice. I can learn LibUV and use that. So here is how you make a TCP server in LibUV. This is all C code. You have to create your, you have to malloc your C struct for your server. You have to initialize it. You bind to your port, you check for errors, you listen, which is basically adding a connection listener. That 128 there is backlog. I still don't know what a TCP backlog is, but 128 is a good number. And, and then you run the event loop. In Node.js, this is implicit. The, if the run happens at the end of, your first call, end of your first tick. But in libuv, it's all very explicit. And then over to the right is the on connection callback. So this is callback programming in C. Be glad you write callbacks in JavaScript. When, whenever someone on the node million list says callbacks are too hard, I'm like, no, callbacks are easy in JavaScript. Try it in C. There's no closures. There's no callbacks as values. It, it's crazy. Everything is just a global function. 
So here's more of the code. That's the onread callback and the error callback. These were referenced in the first page. So I have two full slides of small code just to make a TCP server. In Node, this is like three lines. So as you see, there's, there's, there's actually an abstraction between LibUV and Node. And I learned that, oh, there's more to this than, than a scripting language. There's an abstraction layer as well. So the next step is I had to learn Lua. I'd never programmed in Lua before in my life. I'd never read any Lua. But I wanted to port Node to Lua. Probably not a good idea. So this is an excellent book if you want to learn Lua. It's, I don't know if it's translated, but I liked it. I read English, and I read the whole book. It's not very big. That helped a lot. There's a mailing list for Lua on Freenode, or a mailing list on Google, and then a Lua channel on Freenode, and they're pretty helpful. And then just bookmark the documentation in your browser. And with all these resources, you can learn Lua. It's not hard. It's extremely similar to JavaScript. So all right, now I know the language, and now I know LibUV. Let's get this done. So what APIs do I want? So my first idea is, can I use Node-style APIs? Are the languages similar enough that I could just use the same idioms? And it turns out you can. So Lua has tables. JavaScript has objects. They're both things that have keys and values. They're very similar. There's no inheritance in Lua, but there are these things called meta tables, which are basically JavaScript proxies. And using meta tables, you can say, when a key is accessed that doesn't exist, go look in this other table. And there you go, you have prototypal inheritance. If you want to implement another inheritance model, go ahead, you can do it. And anything can be used as a key in Lua, so tables are more like JavaScript maps. You can put a table as the key. You can put a function as the key. You can, anything as a key. It's kind of cool. Tables cannot contain nil, which is the same as null and undefined combined. They're just nil. You can't have nil as a key or a value. If you put nil as your value, it deletes the key. So there's some interrupt issues here, but for the most part, it works like an object. And then a big one with functions is there is no this. And this made me happy. I hate this in JavaScript. It confuses everyone. It's useful, and if you're doing object-oriented programming in JavaScript, you kind of have to use it. But at the same time, it's really confusing, especially when you're doing callback-based event code, because your callback is a new function with a new this, and you have to bind everything. And it's hard. In Lua, there is self, which basically means you pass the first argument to self. A function is a function. There's no magic. So since there was no object system built in, I made an object system. So object is a table. So it's got the same curly brace syntax as JavaScript, except you use equals instead of colons. And then I store a meta property. And underscore underscore index is the meta table for, meta, meta method for property not found. So object new, now the colon syntax here means when you define this, assume there is a first argument of self, that's syntax sugar. So I basically create a new object whose meta table is self.meta, and if that object has an initialized function, I call the initialized function, pass them through the arguments. So I now have Ruby style constructors. I can make objects that inherit from objects that have constructors. And that's all it takes. That's my entire object library. And then extend is to create a class that extends from a, a parent class. So does self, how does self behave? What is, what, what, what is its level of scope? Is it coming from a function or a mutable always? Or is it? Right, so self is, so self is just syntax sugar. It's the exact same thing as if the first argument had been self. And that's all this is. I can take out the colon, put a dot, and put self. Right. Right. And, and Python does this as well. It's, a lot of languages do this, but JavaScript doesn't. JavaScript has this magic this. So, and over here on the, I'll point to the big one, over here on the right, 
I'm creating a, a rectangle class, which is an object, and I have a constructor, and I store width and height in self, and then I define a method on it, which just returns width times height, and then to create an instance, I call this new method, and since rectangle inherits from object, it calls that, and all the inheritance works, and there you go, class-based programming in 15 lines of code. So while there's no object system built in at all, you can build anything you want. Which was comforting because Node is very object based in a lot of areas. So let's make an event emitter. What would that look like? The actual event emitter used in Lovett has a bit more code than this, but this gives you the idea. So event emitter is an object, on adds an event listener. And you can see here the syntax is a little different. An if, if, then, end, there's no curly braces. Local is like var, and comments are two dashes, which looks weird, but I like it. And basically just, I see if there's a handler's table, and I put the handler in it, and, and notice that I'm storing the, the callback as the key, and setting the value to true. And the reason I'm doing that is because, why did I do that? <laughs> oh, so I could delete them easier. Because when you want to delete them, you just set the, the callback to nil, and that deletes it. You don't have to search through an array linearly, so it's a lot faster. In the end, it turned out this was a bad idea, because keys and loo are unordered, and it's kind of important that event emitters in Node emit their events in the order you register them. So it's a lot more complicated in the actual project now. But this was the first implementation. This was just the exploration phase. I wanted to see if I could do Node-style APIs. And then, of course, there's off and emit, and, and you guys can read the code later. So here is the pseudocode. So on the left, this is node code. This is JavaScript. And on the right is the Lua version of the same thing. This is my goal. I'm going to try to implement this. And other than changing curly braces for end and console log for print, it's pretty much identical. So these languages are very compatible. So is the reason why you chose print there because you said, hey, if there's already an existing node, then I need to do this already. Right. So Lua has print built in. So instead of implementing console log, I just said, yeah, let's do print. I mean, this isn't JavaScript. We're not in a browser. There is no console. So yeah. I mean, I could have done a console log. Then it would have looked really similar. And yeah. And then parentheses are sometimes optional, like in print and require. So it's a very clean language. But if you don't like this, there's a language called MoonScript, which is CoffeeScript for Lua. And MoonScript looks a lot like CoffeeScript. It's very, very similar. I just use Lua. It's clean enough. Wrong way. Told you there's a lot of code. All right. So here's where the fun begins. Lua has coroutines. You can, you, can create, you can pause your stack, go do some other code, and then later resume your stack. So you can have multiple stacks going on at once. And in a non-blocking system like Node, this is very handy. This isn't the best. I have a better syntax now, but this gives you the idea. So sleep is just a wrap around set timeout. So whenever you call the sleep function, it will suspend your coroutine for however many milliseconds and then resume. So there we go, sleep 1000. You can do that, it's okay, it won't break the event loop. If I wanna read from a file, I just read in a loop. This is a synchronous loop. So this, this is a very interesting experiment. And the nice thing about coroutines is you don't lose your stack on every callback. When an error happens, you get the real stack trace. If you throw an exception, it's catchable. Whereas, as we saw in the talk earlier, try catch is kind of, kind of tricky when you have async code involved. So this is a very interesting thing I wanted to play with in Levit. But since Node doesn't have these APIs, it wasn't super high priority. I'm still experimenting with this. I can show you some much better code later I've come up with. So, all right, I want to do this. The languages are compatible. Let's do this. Let's, let's write the bindings. Let's do the dirty work. So in Lua, there are actually two ways to write bindings. One is the application program interface, the API, which is write C functions that are callable from Lua. This is how most languages do it. And the advantage of this is it works in Lua and LuaJIT, so you can use either VM. 
Or LuaJIT has this FFI interface where you can call C code from Lua directly. You just have to like tell it the interface, tell it the header file, and you can call C code. So let's compare these. So here are some of the some bits of the header file from libuv. So we've got these cool structs and enums and there's a function, process get title, process set title. And that's all very simple C code. So you feed this as a string to libuv, or to, to LuaJIT, and now you can call those functions. So you just feed it to this header file as a string. So there we go, I'm read file syncing the header file. And it's kind of interesting. Right, so this is the FS module. Yeah, I'm kind of cheating here. <laughs> Assume the FS module exists. <laughs> right, the FFI module is built in the Lua though. So all, all, all libuv functions are C functions. They don't throw exceptions, they return error codes. So you have to UV check on every return and have to go look up the error if there's an error code and then I convert that to a real Lua exception with this error function. And so here's my bindings. So I write my bindings in Lua. So these functions are Lua friendly. So this is a, this is a neat technique. I kind of like it, and it's very, very fast because of the way LuaJIT works. Usually FFI is slow, but in LuaJIT, FFI is actually faster. So I really wanted this to work. So let's compare with the C API. So this top function here, this is a C function callable from Lua. Lua state is this magic thing that gives you access to the, the current Lua state, and then you return the number of arguments. In Lua, return can return any number of values. You can return zero, you can return 10, it's kind of cool. And so here, I call get process title, I get the error code, I check the code, I throw an exception if there was one, otherwise I push a string onto the stack, and then I return one. So. The Lua C interface is very stack based. You read and, and push from the stack. And then down here is my module. So this module is called UV native. And module is a table which has a function called get process title. So when I require UV native, it's gonna have a property get process title which is the C function. So that's not so bad and it's very C friendly because it's in C. I can call the C functions directly, I can use Macros, if I want to, I can use any C capability. Well, the C bindings one, I couldn't do the FFI. And this is because libuv is callback based. And callbacks in FFI don't work. Especially if you have struct values in your arguments. If you're not C coders, this isn't gonna make any sense. I didn't know any of this, I learned C when I did this. So I didn't know C, I didn't know Lua, but I'm gonna do this. <laughs> I've learned a lot. And also at the time, Rackspace was one of the contributors to, Lua, to Lovett, and they were using stock Lua. They weren't using Lua JIT. So if I wanted their, their help, I had to use the C method. So that's what we did. So here's some of the libuv callback signatures. This is just a few of the event types. Nasty stuff. But for a C library, it's pretty clean. All right. Now, that was just the beginning. Now I have to actually finish the project so it's usable through the thicket. So it turns out there's a lot of functions in Node and in libuv. So here's some of the file system functions. You know, you read, write, open, close, sure. And then there's like 50 others. And then UV has ref, unref, update, now. There's a lot of these. And you have to bind every one of these by hand. And every time it's an adventure of how do I do this, and here's my 30 lines of code, and then there's another one. And this took a few weeks. And then, of course, libuv has this type system of C structs that inherit from each other. C is not object-oriented, but libuv is. And so I have this hierarchy of types that all inherit from each other, and they all have their own methods. So I have to figure a way to map this into Lua properly and then do all the methods, and that took another, another few weeks. So the, the trick that libuv uses is there's a union. So all of the struct types have a part that they share with their parent type. And there's a C union. So as long as you use one of them, they're compatible with all the parent ones. 
So you do a lot of typecasting and hope you get the right ones because otherwise nasty things happen. So like I said, callbacks are hard in C. And these are all C callbacks. So there's two kinds of callbacks in libuv. There is the normal function where you get a handle. So that's like I call, oh, what do I call? Like I create a timer object and I start the timer. When on timeout happens, that C function is going to give me a handle to the timer. And there's also request. And a request is like a one-time thing where I do fs.open. So that would be uvfs open. And I, I create a request. And when the on open happens, I get back my request object, which is just this thing that holds data. And one of the properties on that is a void star data property. So inside that data property, I have to hide the necessary data to get to my Lua function that's the real callback. And this was tricky. I went through like 10 different iterations to get this to work. And I still don't know if it's right. I've since written libuv bindings for two other languages, and they're completely different. So I don't know what the right way to do this is, but it's hard. And then, of course, this is not a garbage collected language. C has its own. C is manually memory managed, but I'm also interacting with a scripting language, which is garbage collected, and things get very gray along the boundary. So have you ever noticed in Node how you can do set timeout and not store any reference to the return value, and yet your callback gets fired and everything's fine? Or you can do net.createServer and your callback gets fired, but that callback has parts of the server in it. So there are no JavaScript references to this object that you're calling callbacks on, but somehow it works. And the way this works is Node manually references your VM objects when the callbacks, when you call the thing and then freeze it when the callback happens, and it's all very painful. So this, this was getting very hard. I was getting discouraged. This is a lot of work. I should have known better, right? I don't know the languages. I've never done this before, but whatever. Sounds like planning to JS, but not in JS. <laughs> right. <laughs> planning a conference is hard, too. <laughs> in a country where you don't speak the language. <laughs> right. So I was maybe a couple months into this, and I have over 12,000 lines of C code, and I've never written C before. And I still need to write bindings for these other four libraries. OpenSSL is nasty, by the way. And libuv is a different API than Node. Once I get the libuv bound to Lua, I then have to write this abstraction layer that gives me the Node style API. And turns out that that's another 5,000 lines of Lua. And I want this to work on Windows. I, I'm not a Windows developer. That's not going to be easy. And then, of course, there's no JSON in Lua. JSON is JavaScript object notation. <laughs> so, man, this is hard. I'm going to give up. <coughs> well, I was saved by the community. So Rackspace wanted to make something very similar to this. And they said, hey, instead of making our own thing, how about we just help you? Um, and I said, that's great. That's a good idea. So and we also had other community members, like this random guy in Russia and some people in New Zealand. And now there's a couple people in Japan. And I'm up all hours of the night trying to talk to different people. But we now have a Windows build, which I haven't touched ever. We have integration with Sierra's, OpenSSL, Zlib, and UDP. I don't understand UDP, so I couldn't test the bindings. And they helped me design this object system and write a whole lot of the Lua code that makes it a node style API. So, you know, I did the first easy part, well, not easy part, but I did the first half, and then I did the finish. And I'm not sure which half is harder. So, we're almost there. In initial testing, Levit was four times faster than Node and used 20 times less RAM. Yay. That's good. <laughs> and it was almost API compatible with Node. It was getting there. So we made a web page. The web page actually, the web page actually runs on Levit, though it keeps crashing because there's some bug in my code. And we've made a few releases with pre-built binaries. There's an Android binary that I'm running on my phone. Works great. So I learned that Lua is a cool language. Lua Jet's a lot cooler than V8. And yeah, 
I learned it's really cool. So I think I'm running out of time. No, yes, all right. So I also learned that small code bases make developers happy. When for the, until we added OpenSSL, love it, including Luigi, including everything, would compile in four seconds on my machine. And that makes your contributors happy when they can download the code and build it four seconds later. That's actually worthwhile. Nodes requires algorithm is really nice. We cloned that completely. Lua has a really weird require system. I just threw it away and started over. I don't think I can ever replace Node for web development because JavaScript is the language of the web. But for other types of projects, Lovit is really nice. I have plans to make a Lovit-based OpenGL mobile platform. I mean, make games in Lua on your phone. Why not? You can, you can put Lua in the Apple App Store. They'll let you. You can't put Node in there. It's impossible. V8 only runs with the JIT, and you have to turn the JIT off for iOS. So, and here's the biggest lesson learned. Open source collaboration makes it possible to build anything. I mean, really, I don't know C, I don't know Lua, I've never done this before, but I re-implemented Node in Lua. I could not have done that without the community. So remember, as long as you have a community, you can do anything. It just might take a while. I got a few more slides if you want, or I can question them. Let me see. Yeah, let's see. So here's the challenge. Do something like this for fun, if you want, or pick a smaller project. A couple others I did. Candor.io is libv bindings to Candor, which is a new language made by Fedor and Dutney, or however you say his name, he's Russian. And I helped design the language a little, and we haven't done much in a while because we've both been busy with our jobs, but it, it's a neat project. Another one is, we can look at those later. Well, I have a lot of code. Love Monkey. I wish I finished this one. So Spider Monkey is the Firefox engine for JavaScript. Why not use that? And then it can be really compatible with Node. You can use Express in Love Monkey, theoretically. But it turns out this is really hard. But had I finished it, we'd have generators and all sorts of stuff today. And I think it would be cool to have competing VMs for Node. It works great for the browser. Why not do it for the server, too? So here's how you write C bindings in SpiderMonkey. It's kind of weird. And yes, that's the real end. Thank you. So are there any questions? Okay, multiple questions actually. So thanks for the FFI uh, reference because actually I checked it up and Node as FFI. There's a Node FFI module that yes, you can install, so that's pretty cool. There's a Node add-on, yeah. but it's not as fast. Yeah, probably. And uh, so my question was, uh, so Swig, why didn't you use Swig to generate the Lua bindings? Swig? Swig, Swig is a system that generates. Oh, why didn't I use Swig? Yeah. I don't like code generators. Okay. And I was doing this for fun, so I'm going to write the bindings by hand. Okay, but you could have been a little bit faster if you had it, used Swig, or you, do you think it's not possible? Okay. I, I looked at a few Lua binding generators, and there might be a Swig one, I don't know. But I wanted more control. LibUV is an interesting library, it's callback based, and most things that people write bindings for are not callback based. So it has some very unique constraints when you get near the callback layer. Okay, so the callback would be the challenge. Yeah. So another question, last one. Uh, so the so you've replaced V8 by the Lua JIT, and you've used Lua as the language, and you've created like a parallel, like right. a right, you know, system to Node.js. But wouldn't it have been possible to build a JavaScript interpreter on top of Lua, and then just use the code that's, or it would have th that not made sense at all? It, sure, it's possible. Okay. Um, I don't think it would be faster. And it's a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would be interesting because then you could run it on iOS, but at the same time, you could just bind to SpiderMonkey or JavaScript Core, and I think one of those is allowed on iOS. I'm not sure. Right. 
I was thinking the in the sense that, uh, for example, the TP-Link wireless little routers, right? Th that's they come with Lua, so it would be nice to be able to run Node.js without adding V8 to it. But right, and I'm trying to build Levit for the TP-Link. I have one. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> well, nice. we'll see how far I get. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Odima. Any question? Okay. My question is a uh, the reason why Ryan Day chose JavaScript for the Node.js is because that there is never any I/O library before, so right. he can do anything asynchronously. So uh, since Lua is uh, has uh, any a lot of uh, I/O library before, so there may be some scal scalability problems there. So how can you solve this? Right, I forgot to mention this. So. Lua is not a browser language. It has I.O. There is a module system called Lua Rocks, and it's got its own require system. And basically, I just removed all that in Lovit. Like, one of the first things I do is I delete all the references to those modules. I purposely made it incompatible with Lua Rocks, so you can't use existing modules in Lovit. You have to manually port them. It's a very easy port. You're going from Lua to Lua. You just change a few things and make sure you don't use sync I.O but it shielded me from the sync community because in, in Python and Ruby, they have the same problem. You can use Twisted in Python or Event Machine in Ruby, but as soon as you like pull an active record, suddenly your entire server grinds to a halt because active record blocks on database queries. And that's bad. So I shielded myself by basically making it not compatible with those. I just use Lua for the VM, not for the community, which makes the community sad. They're like, why don't you work with us more? I'm like. We'll see. But yeah, good question. Um, hey, is there a package manager for Lua, like for this? Um, sort of. There's a couple semi-maintained ones. There's definitely no clear winner like NPM. In my projects, I just use Git submodules. But if one of you wanted to make a package manager, that would make me very happy. <laughs> NPM has a lot of great features. Feel free to copy whatever you like. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, can you speak German? Translate it. Use some. Just now, use some code. Use some You have shown some code compared with Lua and. It Node.js, right? Uh -huh. And which version do you choose for Node.js and which version do you choose for Lua? Which version? Yeah. For the example. Yeah. Right. This. No, 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 no. The Not last. this. Performance. Oh, performance. OK. So Lovit was four times faster. This was Node 06 and like the first version of Lovit. This was about eight months ago. Oh. For most of this year, Node's actually been faster. Yeah. And recently, I've made a new, an API change. I'm no longer cloning the Node API. And now love it's faster again. But Node 8 is very fast. Yeah. OK, thank you. Galen, how many questions do we have? So maybe the, one so maybe, more yeah, this one is, uh, any question? Oh, no, okay. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, Wendy Ma. Oh my God. <laughs> you are popular in China, you know. Uh, Okay, his question is, uh, your project, it is, you know, you wrap the 
uh, uh, C libraries, and the people can use Lua as their programming language. Right. Yeah, just write it as Node.js, right? Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, write, you write your programs in Lua. Yeah. Hi, Tim. So uh, you've mentioned that you will uh, host another project. Maybe you can use Lua to programming their OpenGL. Right. So yeah. I want to write a library on top of Levit yeah. where it's OpenGL programs. Mm -hmm. But it's going to use Levit as the core. Yeah. So I think <laughs> so he will ask you personally, right? OK. Okay. Last question. Okay, last question. Uh, how do you do this, Kyle? Do you use Linux AI or Thread Pool or just blocking I.O.? I just use LibUV and it's all handled internally, so it's a Thread Pool. Uh, how does LibUV uh, do this, Kyle? It's on Windows, I believe it's using IOCP, and on everything else, it's using LibEV at the moment, with a th I think. It's, it's whatever Node had before. The nice thing about LibUV is I don't have to worry about that. I just use the LibUV API and it works cross-platform. Thank you. I have a question. One more. Oh, okay. What do you think about the idea of using LibUV as a, as a general layer for abstracting out applications from I.O.? And what I mean by that is like there was, for example, I, I know that we were doing some work, Microsoft was investigating about, oh, maybe Redis, for example, uh, should be uh, abstracted away through LibUV API as a way to allow it to work cross-platform. I'm just wondering what your thinking is around using LibUV as a general I.O. abstraction. Oh, like use LibUV in Redis? Yeah. It's a pretty good library. I'm, now that I've used it in three different projects, I actually wish the API was different. I wish it wasn't callback-based. But it is a pretty good library. It's cross-platform, and a lot of people are using it now. Okay. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you.